Yeah. Good evening. Welcome to the Town of Auburn Energy Committee meeting on Monday, November 28th. It is now approximately called to order at 5.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast by Local Access Programming. Is there anyone here in the audience tonight that is recording tonight's meeting? There being none, let's go to our first agenda item, uh, which is our LED conversion presentation. So, do you, or we can hit a few other items first if you want to get a few minutes. Okay. Why don't we? We're going to reshuffle the agenda a little bit. Do you want to? If you want, you can plug in there and get yourself set up. Yeah. Well. Why don't we do? Or, or do you want to do staff updates first? Sure. I have a few updates. They aren't uh, substantial, but just to let you all know that our our green communities annual report is due this week and so we've been com compiling that information that keeps us in good standing with DOER and maintains our designation as a green community it's an important report uh, so far everything seems to be in order and I don't anticipate any any issues regarding that the um, wind turbine feasibility study the town has come to an agreement with our consultant, SED, and has agreed to put off an acoustic study. They had gone back and forth on some uh, financials regarding the study and they exceeded the cost of the grant that, that we had received. So we decided we'll put off the acoustic study we had already decided to put off a balloon float test. So really what they're going to do is rework the economics and they'll come out with a report and a presentation. And from there, uh, we could you know, decide whether or not we want to recommend continuing to pursue this as an option or not. So I anticipate that early in the new year, we'll have that closed out, um, the study at least. Which is a long time coming. Oh, is that grant strictly for that? For one it's grant, yep. Yep. <coughs> strictly for one turbine. And the last piece, uh, at our last meeting, we had discussed the components um, that we would include in our application to National Grid for the community initiative uh, next year. And I was able to compile that application, and we submitted it uh, at the beginning of this month. And at this point, we're awaiting to hear from National Grid. From what I understand, the training that they're going to provide is really early in the new year, so I'm expecting we'll hear, hear from them uh, by mid-December, would be my guess, on whether uh, we've been accepted or not for the initiative next year. But I think our application was pretty strong um, with the information that we kind of tossed around we have a pretty comprehensive uh, plan of attack, a lot of great ideas to, for doing outreach. So uh, I, I think that we, as a, as a town, are strong contenders for that. Great. So, yeah. Um, so as of now, like I said, nothing terribly substantial, but that's on the docket for for a staff update. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So I'm sure for our, which we'll discuss later, our December slash January meeting we should hopefully have a little more insight into that and we'll start to get people scheduled in. So. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so when we jump back around to our first agenda item, Eric, do you want to introduce our guest here? Sure. So um, this is Patrick Roach. He's coming out from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Thank you. The name always slips mm -hmm. my mind. <laughs> and I saw Patrick present on LED street light conversions two years ago at the National Grid Municipal Summit at Holy Cross. It was a uh, great presentation. And we had the opportunity to seek technical assistance this year to do an LED street light feasibility study, as you all know. Um, it seems like the information has been compiled, processed, synthesized. Um, we've you know, Patrick's done a great job um, working on that. We've done a lot of back and forth. So tonight, he is uh, here to present the findings, essentially, of, of the study. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thanks, Eric. You, Thanks very much, and apologies for my tardiness. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to pass out flyers. Presentation or one is just a street light in Victoria. Help you go over the presentation. All right. So, uh, yeah, as Eric said, my name is Patrick Roach. I'm an energy planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and we were. Um, brought in through a Department of Energy Resources technical assistance grant to help Auburn look at the potential for a street light retrofit, what that might mean. So I'm going to present on the results of that tonight and um, feel free to you know jump in with questions. We can do Q&A at the end too, but um, if you have questions we can make it kind of an open dialogue. And yeah, I think with that um, I'll, I'll dive right in. So for those of you who may or may not know about MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, we are the regional planning agency for the greater Boston area. And um, we uh, have a clean energy group, which is where I sit. What's that? Oh. Sorry. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, there we go. Nice. So we have a clean energy department it's where I sit. Our goal is to help our cities and towns reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in that context, we've done a lot of work around LED streetlights. So we've helped about 30 municipalities, mostly in our region, but some outside our region, um, covering about 70,000 streetlights, uh, help them procure the services to retrofit their lights and help sort of them follow through on that. So that's our background in, in working on streetlight retrofits. So um, I'll just give you kind of a, the executive summary. So first is that in Auburn, you have a little over 1,000 streetlights, 1,123 1, streetlights, and they're on two different rates, which, as we'll get into, provide add some complication to your situation. But if you did a retrofit to LED streetlights from the current, which are mostly high-pressure sodium lights, you'd probably be looking at saving annually around $68,000. The energy savings would amount to 240,000 kilowatt hours, and that would be 818 mmBTUs of energy, or um, based on your fiscal year 2016 usage that, that Eric provided, be about 1.7% of that usage. So in terms of moving to your, hit your green communities goal, um, that could take a good chunk out of that. In terms of how you get there, the retrofit cost we think would be about $346,000. That's after the utility incentive. Um, that works out to be like 25 cents per kilowatt hour you reduce. And then based on that, the payback would be a little over five years, which is pretty good. Um, average tends to be around five to seven years. And the LED lights have an expected life of over 20 years. They're um, warrantied right now for 10 years at a minimum, which is uh, three or four years longer than the existing high-pressure sodium lights even last. Um, and no LEDs have been deployed for over 20 years yet, so we don't know if they'll actually last that long, but they're, you know, they're rated. Um, so you have a long life, and if you look at the lifetime savings uh, after the payback period, it could be as high as about a million dollars. That's what for yeah, over the over the twenty years. Uh, actually, I guess it'd be about fifteen years after we if we take off that first five years where we're paying back the retrofit cost. So what I'm going to do is first just go over some of the benefits of LEDs and why you might um, why you might want to do the retrofit, uh, as well as some of the potential uh, issues associated with them. Then go into the process, just so you have an understanding of sort of how you get from A to B here. And then we'll talk about the the um, the savings and look at the economics a little bit more, and uh, and then I think wrap up finally with just a little review of the the steps in the retrofit process, so you understand what what uh, what's involved. So first off, we're talking about energy savings, and <clears throat> with an LED retrofit, you're looking at between 50% and 70% energy reduction, which is which is quite large, but that's um, generally what we're looking at. 
and <clears throat> along with that you get a more even light distribution and that actually that evenness of light distribution is where a lot of the energy savings comes from so up on up on the top of the um, slide here we have a existing high pressure sodium light that's what most of your lights are here and they have one giant bulb inside and they have this reflector inside and the, the basically this reflector tries to cast light out to the very edges and in doing so, that one massive bulb tends to overlight the area right underneath the light just to get enough light to the outside. So there's actually just a lot of wasted light that's happening there. And um, the, on the bottom, we have the LEDs. So we're looking at uh, the underside of one there. There are these individual diodes. They direct light exactly sort of in the pattern that you want. So in addition to sort of getting less, you know, you know, spray back of light into people's yards or homes, you also um, don't have that wasted light. And so that's where a lot of the energy savings comes from. Uh, and one of the other things you can see is that the existing high pressure sodium, they have this sort of curved, um, lens and the the LEDs have a flat uh, cutoff which um, we'll talk about in terms of uh, helping with light pollution. So LEDs as we were mentioning in the overview have a much longer life than the traditional high pressure sodium bulbs that, that are out there. Those last for about five to eight years. LEDs war warranted for 10 and uh, expected to last for over 20. So uh, they've got a longer life and that directly leads to lower maintenance costs because whether you're doing it on time and materials basis or with like a fixed fee contract it's fewer times that someone has to go up there and replace replace the light so you you have generally have a big savings on on maintenance compared to high pressure sodium lights uh, as we'll see you also have a lot of maintenance savings compared to what national grid is charging you right now uh, one of the other benefits to LEDs is improved color rendering. So CRI stands for Color Rendering Index, and that just means essentially how well the light represents true colors like the sunlight does. So a CRI of 100 would be daylight, and you could see colors just like it was, it was daylight. Um, the high pressure sodium bulbs have put out that sort of orangey glow. They have a CRI of only 22, so pretty low, and that's why most things either look like, you know, they look dark, you know, greens and blues and blacks are all the same under them. So with LEDs, your CRI is up at 75 or higher, so you can see uh, colors a lot, a lot better. Patrick, can you speak to, and I know this was a concern of one of our residents who came to one of our meetings uh, about the type of LEDs that are used and the you know what what shade they are from blue oh to great blue temperature that's going to be the, that one is coming up oh okay sorry so yeah. I'm oh, ahead, I, awesome. I did not look <laughs> no sorry, no I'm glad I, put the, I'm glad I put that you're in taking there. notes <laughs> <laughs> that's great um so in general leds l reduce light pollution primarily because they are full cut off they they have, the, the lights don't extend below the housing of the fixture, which means that the only light that can go up into the atmosphere is the light that bounces off the ground and goes up. Whereas with the existing high pressure sodium, because it has this concave lens below, on its way out, light actually can bounce off that and, and go up. So um, LEDs in general reduce light pollution, um, <coughs> which is, yes, so LEDs in general reduce light pollution. So pollution is... Light. Yeah, wasted light that escapes into the atmosphere. Yeah, and I think uh, folks often talk about light pollution in the sense of maybe reducing the visibility of stars or the you know th things at night, um, which can be very important for some folks in the astronomical community or things like that. Um, so color temperature is is what we wanted to get to next. So most of the um, high, high pressure, I guess, color temperature, the color of the light, the color temperature is, is um, rated on this, uh, the Kelvin spectrum. So the higher the, the Kelvin rating, the sort of the more the whiter the light looks and um, high pressure sodium is down at, at 2000. And we know that's a pretty orangey kind of looking light. Um, for when LED started out, 5000 Kelvin was the norm that is like almost blue it's you know super white almost blue the last few years has been most common has been 4000 which is just looks more white doesn't really have that blue into it and now we're seeing 3000 um, become economically feasible and we did a procurement uh, a little over a year ago and of that I think five communities Gloucester Melrose Salem uh, 
uh, Northampton, uh, maybe one other, all went th with 3,000. And part of it is motivated by the concerns over blue light. So the, yeah, I'll go to the next slide here. So these are three, this is provided by um, a group out in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, um, affiliated with the Dark Skies Movement. So these represent the sort of spectrums of color that are present in the light at different Kelvin temperatures. So high pressure sodium is on the top and generally you have your blue bluer light on the left moving to your greens in the middle and your red on the right. So you can see with high pressure sodium and that's at that around 2000 uh, Kelvin, you really have like a teeny little sliver of blue and it's mostly that orangey red light. When you move to say all the way to the bottom, that's a 4100 Kelvin LED, pretty representative of what a lot of cities and towns have done. You've got a lot of stuff in that. It's a little hard to see here, but might be better on your sheets, but a lot in that purple and blue spectrum. Moving down to 2400 um, eliminates a lot of that, but not all of it. So moving towards 3000 is, a good, is one way that you can help reduce the blue light. And the reason that blue light might be of concern is that the American Medical Association, this link here, put out a advisory earlier this year about the effects of blue light on people, mostly um, relating to issues with like your circadian rhythm, which governs sleep, and the potential health effects associated with that. Um, I think that is all accurate. Uh, what I tend to talk to people about is that we have computer screens and cell phones and TV screens, which also have an incredible amount of blue light in their spectrum. And those are the ones that we're probably exposing ourselves to much more, and that's fine. Um, but it is a, it's a real issue out there that, um, that you want to take into consideration. And one way you can, you know, one way you can deal with that is to reduce that Kelvin temperature. Uh, a few other things you can do. In areas where the lights might be more downtown areas how, or homes are closer to the light, um, in the cases that someone, you know, might have a light shining in someone's window, that's where you'd really want to uh, try to avoid this situation. You can install house shields. We tend to see, um, it's a very small percentage of house shields you need to get installed in any town retrofit, but um, in the cost estimate I did, I included like 10%, but it's basically just a shield that goes in the back to prevent any light maybe spilling back into someone's house. And um, with the way the installer adjusts it, even if the pole is a little bit not parallel, they have some play to make sure the light isn't you know, tilted up and going across the street. So there's some ways just from when you install and with house shields, you can minimize light trespass. Um, another thing is that wireless controls now exist to remotely control the lights. And generally, uh, only a few communities in the state have done this because there's not an economic payback on it right now. Uh, we expect that to change in the near future once National Grid changes how it does its billing for streetlights. But we are seeing that uptake a little bit. And one thing you could do uh, if you had that ability is you could turn off lights, especially in residential areas or areas where there aren't pedestrians late at night, uh, or you could dim them like the city of Cambridge does. They'd bring it down about 30%. So that's one way to help eliminate light trespass and, or, or you know, unwanted light. And then also, you know, we always encourage folks to, you know, when you do this retrofit process, you're going to be assessing where each street light is in town and uh, assessing whether you really need it there. Because a lot of lights were put up because someone called National Grid 20 years ago and said, I want a street light in front of my house when Bobby plays basketball. And uh, he's not there anymore. And so sometimes you don't need that light, especially if it's on like if it's all alone on a, on a road. So you might, might be places you can take out lights as well. So we think that there are some ways you can help mitigate that uh, if it's a concern. So now I'll go into Auburn street light inventory and we'll kind of talk about the, the process. Um, any questions before that about sort of like LED pros and cons or um, anything I just mentioned? All right. So you guys in Auburn have lights on two different tariffs from National Grid. Uh, one is called the S1. We'll call that grid owned, National Grid owned. Uh, they, in that case, they own the light and they do maintenance on it. So it's all in their court for the grid owned. Those are just 210 of your lights. So they're the minority. 
the majority are on S2. Those are the, that's um, called, call them town owned. The town actually owns those, but grid does the maintenance on them. So it's a kind of funny situation. And on, on both of those, the most common light you have is 50 watt high pressure sodium. And that's pretty standard for around the region. Um, we're talking about, and, and that amounts to about 944 lights, so most of your lights. Um, for a retrofit, we're going to take that 50 watt down to 25 or maybe even 19. And so right there you can see it's even a little bit over 50% savings. Um, yeah, so, so there you go. You get higher percentage savings with even bigger lights because there's more wasted light. But with that, we're looking at about little 50-60% savings. Um, there are also 55 poles that are currently on your S1 tariff that are what are called non-distribution poles. They don't support wires or um, or any other anything else. And so, as part of the process or to retrofit, you would take ownership of those and assume maintenance responsibilities. Uh, there's a, one of those on the S2, uh, so you guys already own it. Um, and National Grid's just doing maintenance. And these are mostly metal poles, not, not wooden ones. So we'll talk about maintenance later, uh, or it depends how much you guys want to get into maintenance, but it's a new responsibility that the town would have to take on. But the high level takeaway is that towns have been have owned their street lights since I think the early 2000s when it was when it was uh, made possible. There's a robust market for third party maintenance installer uh, maintenance providers out there, and it can be done um, very reliably and, and economically. So to convert both of these, or to retrofit both of these with LED, you actually need to move them off of their current tariffs and over to the S5. So from S1 and S2 to S5. Um, I will note that probably starting some point next year, National Grid will let you retrofit the ones that are on S1, the, that, that, that small, small percentage of your lights, while staying on that tariff. They would maintain ownership of them. Um, there's a lot that's unknown about that right now. The only reason I know about it is that they've, they've filed it in their upcoming rate case, but it's unclear when that will be approved, and there's a lot that's unknown about it. Um, for example, how long you would actually have to wait to get those retrofitted and what type of input you would have besides the replacement wattage. For example, it looks like they would be using 4,000 Kelvin um, color temperature lights and you probably wouldn't have much of a design, um, m m much ability to do that. So um, I'm going to talk about in this presentation if you do move both of these to the S5 rate, which probably also, you know, if you're going to go out to bid, say, for maintenance on 900 lights, adding an extra 200 in there it probably only makes it a more competitive kind of offer. So I think for a few reasons, it probably makes sense to, if you're going to retrofit, move them all over to the S5 rate. So here we go. We'll talk about the process. So there's only two steps in this process, but there's a few things happening at the same time. So what I'm going to talk about for step one here, we've got 1A, 1B, and 1C. So these can all kind of happen concurrently, right? These things all need to happen, but they can kind of happen concurrently. So first is for the ones that Grid owns, those are S1, you need to get them over to S5. For the ones that the town owns, you need to get them over to S5. And then also you want to secure funding for the retrofit. So to first to move over the ones that Grid owns, again, this is the, the two, only the 200, the minority. Um, to do this, you have to purchase the existing lights and the poles, those 55 poles, um, from National Grid at their depreciated value. So unfortunately, that depreciated value has to be uniquely calculated for Auburn. So you'll have to put in a request. They calculate it for each light and it probably takes three to four months because a lot of towns are requesting this and they have very small staff doing this. Each light individually? Yep, each light individually, I know. Yeah, Rhode Island set one price for everything, but um, not here. There is a standard formula that they have to follow, so they're doing it by the book, but it's kind of a crazy process. And so part of that, would that also, could you do that analysis to say whether you even want to keep that light as a street light, as you mentioned before, mm. or is that a separate exercise? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. You probably, it might depend on what the purchase price comes back at. Okay. Be, some towns get it for a dollar total, 
everything's fully depreciated and they it's just a one dollar transaction fee for all their lights and whatever poles there are um, but other towns it's, it hasn't depreciated because of when lights were installed they haven't depreciated so it could be up to a hundred dollars per light uh, what I modeled in this is about fifty dollars per light for the buyback so I think you could see what that comes comes back at what I'm going to talk through in this process is a way I think that you can do the one of the first steps of the retrofit which is the audit that's where you find out what you have where it is you know GPS locations you could probably do that um, before you decide to buy it back and so that way you could say yeah no we don't we don't want that one's a standalone we don't need that we'll just turn it off and and be done with it so I think you could do that um, yeah so this is a process that is kind of it's gonna take some time but you can decide when to start it and that purchase price can be a little little varied um, switching the ones that the town owns s2 over to s5 this is where you're a little more locked in on timing so there's a contract you have with National Grid and you're allowed to switch to somebody else on maintenance on July 2nd of every year if you notified them by December 31st of the previous year. So it's this pretty rigid schedule. Um, and <clears throat> so I think basically uh, th this is going to be one of your governing factors for, for, for the timing. Uh, but yeah, basically you just need to make that notification to them, and I think there's a little contractual thing that, that happens. Uh, Can that maintenance be time and material, or does it actually have to be some type of yearly contract where we pay X amount of dollars per year, either per light or umbrella or something? It can be either of those. We see with the old H, uh, high pressure sodium, most people did some sort of monthly fee per light because it was so common to have outages that you just wanted somebody there. With LEDs, we're seeing that that rate goes way down for the monthly fee or the yearly fee per light. But some towns are doing pure time and materials because um, the calls are so few, and they're um, essentially deciding to try that out. And the nice thing is, you know, you could sign a contract for one or two years, see how it goes, and then if you felt like you wanted to change the, the model go from there but uh, we see a lot of towns I think what's most common is they do a, a state like a fee per light um, flat fee per light that covers basic stuff like going up and, and swapping out a light if it turns out with a with one that's on your warranty you know getting the warranty processed basically like the routine stuff and then for some of the non routine stuff which might be you know someone might hit that pole and knock it over or uh, National Grid might say, you know what, we gotta, we're taking down our pole. You gotta move your light to the new one we install. You know, some, they, they do that on a time and materials basis for that non-routine stuff. They set aside some funding. Now, can, it, can it be like a local electrician that has the capabilities? Yeah. Does it have to be somebody on a certain list? Um, National Grid does require that they are. Uh, I think it's it's uh, certi I think it's OSHA certified. Uh, um, I could double check on that, but there, there's a qualification that uh, they need to have, um, I believe. But as long as they have a bucket truck, and I think most electricians would, would probably fall under that. If the town has a bucket truck too, some towns like City of Salem, they have a bucket truck and a bunch of staff, a bunch of electricians. They do the routine stuff. So if the town does have a bucket truck, that's an option too. What do most towns do? Do they hire like a property management lighting company of some kind? Yep, like yeah. Siemens, Coviello, Daigle, some of the largest electrical contractors in the state. Um, they're like the most common bidders, but you can definitely do someone more local, especially for like the routine stuff, or like Salem, if you have a bucket truck, that, that can change the equation. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk more about maintenance too. Um, <laughs> Do you know? Do you know? <laughs> I don't know if anybody knew that. Jack? Yes. Do we have a bucket truck? We do every three months. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we share one with uh, with other communities. Okay. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. It's actually, as reliable it, as we it's like. actually a tree, you know, for right. coming trees, mm -hmm. but I mean, it does Like a same, cherry picker. Same thing. Hmm. In, uh, in a conversation with the TPW director, Bill Coyle, at, at this point in time, his, his sense was that if we were to go forward with something like this, the town wouldn't be in a position to take over the routine maintenance. So wouldn't be. Right. So we'd subcontract. So we would. We would look to subcontract. Right. That, that's the main right. reason. That we have the, the truck, not right. the person. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so yeah, so switching switching the, the grid-owned ones is going to require some sort of purchase. We'll find out what that is at some point. Uh, switching the town-owned ones is really just a notification, but when July 2nd rolls around, you're going to be ready to do maintenance. Um, the, the, the final piece of sort of getting everything in order is securing funding. So the Green Communities program as a way a lot of communities have funded their streetlight retrofit, and I think with, at, at Auburn's cost of 360000 or so, that might be on the high end. Depend, uh, I think we've seen like, you know, 250000 grants. So it, it's possible. I would certainly buy down the cost that you have to finance. Uh, I often encourage communities to use it on projects that have tougher paybacks, honestly. Um, but, you, you know, you could definitely choose to apply for a Green Communities grant. For whatever is left after you sort of get, say, grant funding, uh, you're going to have to get financing to be able to sign the sign a contract. So that could either be in the form of a bond issuance or a lease. A lot of communities do leases. These both need to get approved at town meeting. So that's also another one of your timing restrictions. Um, and once whatever that a final amount is, you can you're going to ultimately it will reduce the amount you totally pay with the utility incentives and um, there is a, a grant coming up from the Department of Energy Resources which you might be able to qualify for so that would help you you know pay back the bond or pay back the, the financing quicker um, but uh, yeah so so securing funding uh, was is the other is piece I guess you would avoid the, the interest payments. Um, the leases are tax exempt municipal leases, and because they're tax exempt, they're pretty low. They haven't been as low as some of the bonding lately because interest rates have been so low. So we've seen a lot of communities bond it as well. But if you got a, you know, yeah, you could definitely just pay for it up front and then you get the savings, you know, from, from day one. So. so once you have those sort of balls in order, um, you want to procure your retrofit and maintenance services. And what I think, I think what would be, in your case, what would be great is if you could try to begin the retrofit, like replacing the lights when the town is assuming the maintenance responsibilities. So let's call it July 2nd of any given year. And the reason that it could be good to do that is that uh, you can't touch the lights until you own them, but you could do all your design and all your planning um, before that. And then once you once they install them there's the installers give a one year workmanship warranty so if any and then of course your lights are under a 10 year warranty so if anything goes out in that first year you've got someone to go up and replace it for free um, and that's what like the city of Melrose is doing right now for example so if you could time it that would just make things a little simpler and then you can you know while that while the retrofits happening you could go out for a maintenance contract um, to, to, to start once it's once it's done and so I think it, in summary on the process side, it's a little more complex than other towns, but you, know, you get your town meeting and the, the requirement for the grid-owned streetlights kind of govern your timeline. And I think a good goal would be to say, you know, if we can get approval at town meeting for funding, and then we can um, you know, execute the buyback of the existing lights and do that sort of in time for that you know, July start, I think that could be a great way to kind of bring everything together and, you know, if, say, I think, because the end of the year is coming up so quick, we're probably looking at making that notification to National Grid sometime in 2017. Mm -hmm. So if you were looking at, okay, that means July 2018 is when we could be replacing lights. In the spring of 2017, you could secure approval for financing. Um, and then sometime in 2017, you notify Grid that you want to make that change for maintenance. So that will happen in July of 2018. Um, say in January in the winter next year, you could procure the services to do your street light audit, do your design, and then you could be working over the winter and spring to get the audit done, finalize the design, maybe even place the order for product if you wanted. And then um, July comes and you've you know executed the purchase, you move over to take maintenance of those um, town owned lights and you could begin the retrofit. So I think there's a way that if you kind of get things in order uh, in 2017, you'd be ready to really um, nail it in 2018. Um, oh, go ahead. Hey, could you see any towns, um, is it, do they go 
and hit all of the lights? Or have you ever seen where they'll do, you know, a percentage or a portion? Or And is there advantages or disadvantages to, mm -hmm. you know, taking, because this looks like it's everything. You know, yeah. is there any value in maybe kind of breaking that out? Or, or is that more problematic? Most towns, actually all the towns, have, they've done it in one fell swoop, except in some cases they separate out their decorative lights. And forgetting from the inventory, I don't think there were many, like there's sort of like the acorn style, like downtown decoratives that some towns have. Those historically have had much worse paybacks. So they haven't, um, sometimes towns left those for a second run or something, or they liked the orange glow downtown. But generally, um, I think it probably make it, it seems to have made the most sense to have, especially you know when you're hiring an installer, you're getting them to do all this kind of some economies of scale there. Um, yeah, I would say. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is just a table that kind of walks. We'll just walk through the economics and the energy savings now. So this is an example for your most common light, the 50 watt, where the where the savings are. So on the bill, you've got the distribution rate, which is for grid to get the electricity to you on the wires. Then there is um, the, the supply charge, um, which is you know the amount of energy you use. And then we have the luminaire charge, which is something you're paying currently. That covers maintenance right now. It covers maintenance and some other you know cost recovery things for them. When you move to the S5, the luminaire charge goes away. You're just paying delivery and supply. And you now would add in your own third-party maintenance cost. So the first two lines are your, your current two rates, the S1 and the S2. And you can see what's, and then the last line is, is S5, where you would move on the LEDs. And what's interesting is that your rate, your distribution rate actually increases when you move to S5. It's like a little cost recovery mechanism for them. But because your total um, kilowatt hours are going to be falling so dramatically, you know, the net for your distribution cost will go way down. So say for a given light right now, your distribution cost, you're paying about $17, you'd be expecting to pay about $9. And then the luminaire charges right now, they're quite large. For the for the S1, the ones that Grid owns, those are only, that's the minority of your lights. It's about $60 a year. Um, for the ones that you own, the S2, it's only $26. But both of those go away. And then you'd be replacing that with a third party maintenance charge. We tend to see it's um, $6 per light per year. That covers the routine stuff. And in the tables I'm going to show you, I have the costs for the non routine stuff, the pole knockdowns, the light transfers. Just doesn't transfer very well to a per light kind of cost. But basically, you can see that the, the, the final column shows that, you know, with a light on S1, Right now, you're paying about $78 a year. On S2, it's about 44 And on S5, you're going way down to about 15 So the saving, that's with an LED retrofit. Um, so the savings are, are quite large. You're going to give some of that back and some of the other maintenance costs that we'll walk through. But I just wanted to show you sort of where costs are changing and what's, what's happening. So this is taken from the report that I prepared for for Auburn that we can we can circulate um, uh, t to you. So this just this is our current your current annual energy costs and the uh, each each of the rates is broken out separately and then we have the total. So we'll probably focus on the total, but happy to talk about questions on on each one of them. So currently you're using about four hundred thousand kilowatt hours in the top right and. The total distribution charge at that is around $27,000 a year. And then adding on top of that a luminaire charge of $42,000 and a pole charge for those like 55, 56 poles, there's also a, a yearly fee for that. That adds another uh, $52,000 or so. And then the town indicated that even though GRID does the maintenance, they the town still pays for like the equipment needed. So if uh, if the light is out, grid puts it back up, but the town pays for the light. So they budget about $1,000 a year for that. So um, total for maintenance, you're paying about 53000 And the bottom line, the second to last line is just the supply, the electricity at forty-two. 
So that rolls up to about $123,000 a year. The next slide will look at what will happen after the retrofit. So, uh, and, it, and since you have your flyers, it might be good to, <laughs> if you want to look back and forth, it's probably where to do it. So you can see our, our kilowatt use goes down to 151. Um, so that's about a 65% reduction. And uh, honestly, also part of that is due to some oddities of National Grid's tariff. Instead of getting billed, if you have a 65 watt light, instead of getting billed at 65 watts for LEDs, they, um, they have these buckets, these bins. So if you're from 0 to 50, you get billed at 25. If you're from 50 to 100, you get billed at 75. So sometimes that can work in your favor, other times it can work against you. Um, we tried, I think what I tried to do here was not take any huge l liberties, um, but <clears throat> I use sort of standard r retrofit um, r replacement wattages. So your usage goes, uh, goes down by about 65%. And your distribution charge goes down by more like 50% because that distribution rate went up a little bit. Routine maintenance here um, at that uh, $6 per light works out to about 6,000 uh, because you have a little over 1,000 lights, or actually 7,000, I should say. And then for non routine labor and equipment, um, you have $18,000 in there. So that would cover, uh, I have a slide at the end that says exactly what that covers, but that would cover a couple knockdown say someone hits the pole normally you can go after and if, if you know who it is you can get their insurance to pay for it but you might not so a couple pole knockdowns um, a couple mast arms those are the arms that, that the lights on sometimes those might get damaged by a tree or maybe they need to get get replaced um, also a couple light transfers again if, if grid on one of their poles says we're taking this pole down you need to have someone put your light back up on that new pole um, and then it also covers some like just hours for an electrician to do maybe random wiring things or, or stuff like that. And I think this is pretty in line with what we've seen in some other communities. So Melrose and Gloucester uh, each have a little over 3,000 street lights and they budgeted about 50,000 and like 40,000 respectively. So Auburn has about a third of that and um, the, this actually works out too just a little, I think a little over a third. So I think that's a pretty good maintenance number. So now you're paying 25,000 in, in maintenance. Supply charge goes down um, two uh, because you're using less electricity. And so we're now our totals at 55,000 a year. And so that was from 123,000. And so that's about a 55% cost savings. And yeah, at the end of the presentation, I've got all the maintenance assumptions. So this is kind of where we put it together. Cost of the buyback and the retrofit, what would the payback be in the savings? So for the buyback, that only affects that first column, the one that the grid, grid owns. I assume $50 per light. Um, I think as you'll see, we, we could double that to, to the 100, and I'll, I should run that for the final report. Um, I, your, your numbers are going to work out pretty well. Uh, but that cost doesn't exist for the ones you already own. Then we have retrofit costs. Um, I developed these using the costs we've seen in our most recent procurements to go end to end from full design to, to retrofit. So we expect the total cost with buyback and retrofit to be about 409,000. The utility incentive is very regular and guaranteed, 25 cents per kilowatt hour saved. So that would bring it down to about 346. Now D the Department of Energy Resources is about to open up a a grant um, called their Rapid Retro LED Rapid Retrofit Conversion Program. We're calling it Rapid Retrofit. Um, MAPC will most likely be the one administering that program, and it will provide 30% rebate after utility incentives for installation and equipment. So it's not a full 30% of the cost of the project, but it does tackle some substantial costs because equipment and and installation is the majority of, of the cost. Now that program is slated to run through June of 2018. So that's where, that's where it would be, a, it's a little questionable whether Auburn could take advantage. We're hoping that there's going to be, um, well first off that program was supposed to start in September of this year and it hasn't yet. So it's possible the end date could get moved out. We're not sure about that. Um, secondly, we, 
we're hoping to have a process where towns and cities can reserve funding. You know, they can sort of sign to say, we plan to do this, and then we'll estimate the amount of funding you need and reserve it. So I think it's it's possible that on your timeline you could access it. Again, the good news is I don't think you need it to make it a financially viable project. Um, and so we'll certainly be doing lots of messaging and working with the other RPAs to get the word out once that happens and it is, is a possibility. Uh, so your annual energy savings um, down there about 249,000 and that translates I broke out the distribution supply and maintenance savings so roll that up and you get to about $68,000 of savings um, and I did note down at the bottom here that the retrofit costs include an assumption that we have 10% of your lights get those house shields and that's probably higher than normal I think Melrose said they installed 70 on you know 3,000 street lights but um, it's in there and so when we look at our, our payback here the um, you can see the the pay the total payback is about five and a half years after the utility incentive and uh, because of that that luminaire charge is so big on the grid owned lights the s1 has only a three-year payback your s2 is 6.3 years but you put those together I think it's another good reason to put the project together probably uh, you get to five five point one years and then the we get down to the savings after the payback period and so in just the equipment warranty period those first ten years that that's you're guaranteed them to last that long there'd be about four hundred thousand dollars worth of savings and uh, during the expected useful life we'd have about a, a million so that's um, yeah it's a pretty generally a pretty good looking project uh, I think and I have basically have two slides left one is just what the services are that you would go through through the process on the numbers do we have want to ask any questions on that happy to dive in if folks want to but uh, but I mean LED retrofits have been you know it's been something that has been like really economically viable for probably like four or five years now national grid didn't even have a tariff that supported leds until three years ago so you haven't seen many national grid communities do it the first who did it were the ones who owned their street lights already um, because there were maintenance savings so they were ready to jump on it but um, no this is this is the right time to be looking at it and the economics are generally uh, looking very good so in terms of the services that you need to um, to acquire the audit is always the first step that identifies your existing inventory generally the utility inventories are fairly accurate except that they don't those inventories don't tell you where the lights are it tells you what it tell, it tells you what the pole is and what the pole number is but there's no spatial correlation there's no address someone has to go out there and find it so value of the audit is that you get you come out with a um, a GIS layer that has all the points for all of your lights it's going to turn up some lights that weren't there and some that that uh, that are there that weren't on the list so you'll have an accurate list of all your lights and where they are and the wattages and the type and so that wattage and type information is key to figure out what are the possible energy savings um, and the location information really plays into the design factor because what you want to figure out are uh, what light levels do you need and the utilities did not do that when they were putting up their lights <laughs> but you have a chance to kind of say how much light do we need on the street because what was there is necessarily the right amount so through the through the design process we usually have communities work with the vendor to get they, they run um, simulations based on the spacing and height of your poles with different types of lights the wattages so you can see how those light levels compare to some of the standards out there you don't have to hit any standard but but there are some sort of like best practice standards so that's where the design process comes in and they'll also help you walk through like you know what there are the cheaper plastic you know plastic component models and there are the higher end um, models so they'll help you for figure out what brands what light levels are what do we need then there's of course the product which is the light itself called luminaire and a photo cell that's when it tells it to turn on and turn off that photo cell has traditionally been just a little sun uh, sunlight receiver but increasingly we're seeing communities do wireless controls which would allow you to schedule to dim and have that remote control again right now you're not going to see any financial savings for that because 
National Grid doesn't have a meter on any of these streetlights. They just assume how many hours it runs based on the daylight. So when if you started dimming or something like that, they would continue assuming how many hours it ran. There's a lot of people pushing for them to use the data that your wireless controls would report out as a, a billing surrogate. I know Cambridge is actively pushing that. Westwood has it. Randolph has it. A number of communities in Rhode Island have it where National Grid serves. So I think that is possibly coming and it could be something um, that's maybe one advantage of not being able to go to 2018 is that there might be some movement on this in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah, that is something that exists today for sure. You probably wouldn't see the the billing savings until they change that tariff, but they but I was it, more it's cheaper. Of the, yeah. The yeah. Well, I think it exists, and it would probably be cheaper to purchase than the wireless controls right now. So if you were looking at how what's the cheapest way we could, you know, dim lights or have them turn off, that would probably be cheaper to. Achieve than the wireless controls, so it's a possibility. I don't think we've seen many communities do it, um, but that's something where in the design phase, I think you'd have someone help you sort of walk through what that might might be like and what that might mean. Uh, yeah, and then you have your installation, and that can be done by any of the large electrical crews. We we do see some of the smaller electrical companies win these bids too, so. Um, get get installation done and then you have your application for utility rebates often what we see is some communities have done these turnkey projects where they have what's called like an, an ESCO the energy service companies who do the huge energy efficiency projects they do it turnkey soup to nuts a lot of convenience there um, there's also they have markups and I think it's a it's great. They're great in situations where, they're, where, the, where the savings and the project itself is very complex. Um, we've been moving with a lot of communities recently to more of a traditional public works model where you hire a, someone who's going to do the audit design and stay on board for the construction management. You'll go out to bid for product. You'll go out to bid for installation, but they'll be helping you, you know, draft that RFP, review responses, and They'll, they'll help with the rebate application. So definitely a very achievable kind of thing. And uh, they could do that audit and design, uh, maybe even go out to bid for product, which you, product usually has a few month lead time. So, you know, all before installation happens. And that's um, so you can kind of get all that stuff ready and done before you wanted to go do the retrofit. And then I'll just point out that this is all the maintenance assumptions uh, that were built into my calculations. So some of the stuff I was just talking about, new metal poles, new mast arms, labor, and some incidentals. So uh, that's that's all built in there. And that's that's it. Have you seen anything with pilot programs, like for certain areas, of what type of light fit best as a certain? Yeah. Just with, with the discussions we've had previously yeah. that were about, you know, the daylight, LEDs, Mm -hmm. The blue light. The blue well, especially if you have some, since you have some time, pilot, a pilot, you know, you could fit that into your schedule pretty well. I think the good things to look at in, in terms of pilots are uh, more um, comparing color temperatures. So maybe having a cup. You generally, you want to work with someone or do your pilot in a way that um, has a couple lights, at least probably two of them, the same type together, and then like not too close but not too far away some of the other types so they don't blend into each other um, but you can kind of easily go from one to the other so I think color temperature would be great if you wanted to see do, you know do people really like that 3000 is that 4000 too harsh um, difference brand to brand sometimes there can be a little bit because each of these lights gets rated for different levels of like glare and things like that so that could be something else that you might want to incorporate into the pilot. Um, and if you do, the I think the key is you just can give people the right instructions for viewing the pilot. So 
I don't know when the last time anyone looked straight up into a street light was, but if you have a pilot, I guarantee you that that's what most people will do. And they'll say, oh, it's blinding. It's, it's horrible. I can't believe it. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of you need to make sure you set the expectations ahead of time for, like, how you effectively judge this. Um, and I think you can look to some towns. I think Melrose did a pilot with their, with their vendor. Um, they might have had six lights in groups of two, so three individual things. So there are a couple of towns I think you could look to for some, you know, guidance to see how they did it. Yeah. And we would have to own and maintain the street lights in order to do the pilot. Oh, that's correct? a good point. Uh, you know what? The answer is yes, but I bet working with National Grid for the ones that you guys own mm -hmm. and they maintain I bet there'd be some if you I bet there would be some wiggle room just because from their perspective they they might still be billing you at the high pressure sodium rate. Yeah, there might I bet I bet that they'd have some wiggle room there if it was only a few. I think it's worth asking. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're going to do that, I'd say you definitely yeah, meet with a few of the vendors. To, um, kind of get a sense for what the big characteristics are that you want to compare um, and then you could make an informed choice about getting a few up there and you probably would need to have a little budget set aside for someone to go up there and you know swap out the light mm -hmm. some commu some vendors might donate lights for your pilot but I think that's a little rare now so you might you know a light probably around $150, $200, I would say. So there's a little bit of budget probably to do that pilot okay. as well. Yeah. Great. Do you have any other questions? Well, Patrick, thank you. This was fantastic. Thank Excellent. You. Yeah, and Eric, I'll follow up with you. We can, you know, put anything, if anything else in sort of the final report that we want to, you know, really nail down, we can sure. work on that. But Sounds great. Great. Oh, thanks very much, everyone. I Thank will. You. I'll email a copy of the presentation to you. I'm mm -hmm. going to take my flash drive with me now. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Sorry, I was late. No problem. So, Eric, as far as next steps, what happens from here? So, from here, my suggestion would be that the, the committee would make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. that this is, is a project that should be on their radar. So in that recommendation, perhaps, you know, we, we reference the study, you reference the savings, and mention, you know, that other towns are, are already doing this. Um, type of activity and and then from there we would need to bring this information to the board of selectmen mm -hmm. and to I think this is you know a great great form this presentation has been you know recorded videoed um, for a rebroadcast so we can share that mm -hmm. presentation but um, it, I think we would just begin to do the, the outreach to get board select and buy-in and resident buy-in if, if it seems like a project that the committee would want to recommend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before we discuss the motion, is there any other discussion? I mean, we've been, we've been talking about this for a while, I feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. The whole committee's kind of been in support of moving forward and I think having this information versus where we were, say, six months ago, <laughs> um, it, it, it just kind of think confirms all of our, at least for me at least, the thoughts that we had on it, and it mm -hmm. definitely feels, it always had that good gut feel to it, but mm -hmm. this is definitely something a little bit mm -hmm. kind of meatier to, you know, to support it, so. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, or anybody like to entertain a motion to make a formal recommendation? And Eric, would your thoughts be that we, um, that we go to the selectmen's meeting, or? Just provide like a letter of recommendation or actually a letter of recommendation to to the town manager and the board of selectmen. Okay. That the town um, pursue 
Okay, are you an LED street light retrofit? Anybody like, like to second the motion? I'll second. All right, all in favor? Favor? Okay. All right, by unanimous vote, the committee recommends that we pursue the LED light retrofit. Um, I'll take that as a to-do, just to do a draft of the letter and circulate it first sure. before we actually submit it to them. Great. All right, from there, we go to our next agenda item, public comments. Any comment from the public? I do actually have two for the kind of informal discussion. Uh, I know we need to revisit our uh, December meeting, so I figured we could talk about it here. Mm -hmm. um, right now we have it scheduled for December 26th, and um, obviously with that being close to the holiday, um, just wanted to see what people's availability would be and if we want to push it to another date. I do want to circle back, though, as I was thinking about it, Eric, as you mentioned, originally with the Community Initiative Program, mm -hmm. they talked about doing the training in December mm -hmm. because the period of time for us to maximize that program, this is really the rub. So right. it's in 2017, mm -hmm. so, we, so we're going to be benchmarked based upon anybody who goes into the Mass Safe's program effective 1-1 one, one mm -hmm. to 12 31. now that outreach to really get out there should really start in december mm -hmm. because people it would take time right. and even if we're doing that outreach for a full 12 months anybody that we contact in december they might not call until january so we would be ineligible um so um and I guess my, my concern to that would be if we could time our December meeting kind of closer to when we find out at a minimum whether we've been approved for the program mm -hmm. and at least this group can talk about is there anything we could start even in advance of the training. So to that I guess I would say rather than um, push it to January, you know, are there any other dates that we could possibly revisit for folks in December? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for me, I know that I know that Monday, and if and if we just want to have that meeting, and then I can follow up with folks separately. Um, actually, I think I could I could probably do. I think I could do the nineteenth. So, or I guess I I throw that out there to the group. So, what dates really work for people in 19th December? Nineteenth works for me. The 19th of Monday, so that's the Monday before. And so at least hopefully at that point we'll have an answer back in regards to um, whether we've been approved. Mm -hmm. And at a minimum, I think it would be a valuable for us to use that time to revisit uh, the proposal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and at least think about is there anything we can do to kind of hit the ground running I mean, that last week in December will probably be shot, but beginning of January, even in advance of the training, yeah. so that we're really maximizing the time available to us. So, yeah. that's great. Great. Yeah. All right. So, if you will, 12 17. Mm -hmm. uh, any formal correspondence for this session? I didn't see no. anything. Great. All right, and now the minutes, which I incorrectly um, put the date on the agenda is the September 22nd meeting. My <laughs> apologies, it is uh, the 24th. Mr. Mitchell is not here, who usually catches me on all of my mistakes. Yeah. Um, so I distributed them to folks. I didn't know if people had an opportunity to review. Yeah. Did we notice anything that needed to be updated? Changes, edits? All right, would anybody like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes? I'll approve. We have a motion. All right, when we vote, all, of, all in favor of approving the minutes? Okay. So we'll have a vote of four. The motions are approved. Mr. Mitchell is stepped out. Our next agenda item is our next regular meeting, as we discussed, will actually be Monday, December 17th. 19th. 19th, correct, the 19th. <laughs> 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 
as you can see, dates are not my strong suit. Uh, <laughs> Five thirty here. Uh, Eric, do you see any conflicts with us having this as the available location? Can you just confirm that for us? I'm actually not aware when the school committee meets. So I can confirm. You that. can confirm. We will tentatively schedule it here for Five West Street. Um, and if not, then we will update the right. agenda prior to it going out with the correct location. Yeah. So barring that, there are no other agenda items. Would anybody like to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting? I shall. We have to second. Jack, thank you. All right. All in favor? All right. Motion approved, and the meeting will be closed at 6.37.